So the computing environment, so once we already pulled the data, then we... Sure, we use a variety of software packages, MATLAB, Python. Um, we have a couple of servers that are located at the co-location facility at Scripps that have um, most of our data drives that will pull the data and store while we um, you know, determine how best to do the analysis. Um, we're currently looking into options to, to go to a couple different supercomputing facilities where we'll do essentially the same thing. But, um, but our software is MATLAB, Python, um, and um, you know, both my colleagues at, at Irvine and here at San Diego, uh, we do have a you know, different combination of scripts that we use to, to run to, to pull out the objects, store them into a database, a Postgres database, and then do the analysis. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what that is. PC. A PC, yes. Thank you. <laughs> There was a question. Slide down, okay, so Emma, you had a slide where you showed that it, that it originally, originally you take 20 days or something, and then of course uh, the DVN uh, brings that back to 10 seconds, but then you are still left with uh, 10 days. So what is currently the same workflow uh, at this time? So when we first met with Dr. Smarr and, and uh, John Graham, Tom was there as well, uh, John set a benchmark of reducing that 20 days to 20 minutes. And so we're in the process of looking at using GPUs for the segmentation, um, you know, using harnessing the Fiona and the PRP in order to, to pull and, and, and pass the data back and forth. And so we're trying to put together a plan and already making good progress on doing the code conversions to take advantage of the Comet supercomputing facility or a potential uh, cluster of GPUs. Uh, to be able to speed up that entire workflow. Um, but we're just trying to take it kind of one step at a time in order to, to really allow at least folks at Scripps to build up the expertise and an understanding um, of you know, the different technologies that are available, as well as my colleagues at, at Irvine. Any other questions from the audience before I start in? Yep, up front here. So, so this gang does a lot of demos at supercomputing, as you've noticed, right? So that's a good place to do things where there's like-minded people and, and a mix of people in scientific computing and world's best networking uh, gang uh, uh, trying to push the boundaries. Um, of course, we spent years doing, you and I and our friends, doing demos all around the world, but they're all focused on visualization. There's actually something to show an audience, right? And you can actually knock their socks off. They can go wow and everything. It's a little harder when you're uh, trying to show the performance curves of, you know, GPUs or something. And so for that, uh, I mean, my personal deadline for this conference was to get some measurements so I could stand up and say that I wasn't generalizing from a sample of one, you know, and that's, I'll do that on Thursday. But that, <coughs> that was my goal, and I think other people that we challenged to, I'm sure all the slides you saw today were pretty much new for this. So in, in sense, this is a PowerPoint demonstration of what we understand. So it's, it's a little bit simpler when you're not, um, you're not trying to do live demos. And um, it's a workshop, anyway. Richard? Um, this is a question primarily for me, but perhaps others as well. Uh, you mentioned the difficulty in um, evangelizing. Uh, did, did you have any further suggestions or ideas for specific efforts that, that people can do on their local campuses in order to <coughs> evangelize? And, and 
any scalable ideas beyond kind of accidental one-on-one -on -one engagement? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I like the idea of force multipliers, and I think that if we look for those uh, force multipliers on our campuses, that they can be helpful. So for instance, um, likely partners could be found in research IT areas like um, Jeffrey and Shaw um, explained. Sometimes those are within a CIO's office, sometimes they're within a library, um, sometimes they might be within a school of information. Um, so I would say it, it varies somewhat um, depending on the campus situation, but those might be likely places for us, you know, sort of uh, trying to bridge that gap between infrastructure and science um, to look for people who are already engaged with some of those um, target audiences. Um, and then as to, to have that scale, I think speaking at conferences is a good thing. And thinking about metrics, I was also wondering about um, trying to encourage people who benefit from the PRP to include that in their publication uh, acknowledgments. You know, you, you use an NS, you have to uh, acknowledge the NSF by a specific grant number if you publish um, findings based on funding from them, but I wonder if that might also be a way at least to raise the visibility of the PRP um, to ask those faculty that you know have benefited from it um, to include a line about that in their um, citations and publications. Well, let me jump in and add something there too. So in, uh, a way to do this, to take this uh, idiosyncratic approach, as you, uh, I think you called it, is, uh, <coughs> is to do it with a vengeance. In other words, uh, mm -hmm. and this I learned from Larry, uh, is you pick somebody in a sector, and say like Scott here, and you say, okay, we're going to dump all the resources we possibly can on you, and we're going to make you famous in six months, and go for it. And some of them run away, but Scott hasn't. Mm -hmm. But seriously, this is a way that you then he gets to show his colleagues, right? Because he gets to be the evangelist, right? He gets to show that he has benefited from it. And we've done this with Fortune 500 companies. We've done it with faculty members over the past 30 years. And it, you really have to find somebody to <laughs> receive this effort, but you can't do it for everybody, but you can make somebody, you know, rise and become a, a model. And that's, I think that's a good use of our time and our effort and our money, frankly. So, and I would also add that um, uh, it doesn't matter if somebody has invited me to, to give a talk on, um, you know, any subject you might invite me to talk on, I always have a couple of slides about you know, big data movers and the PRP and what the Science DMZ network is and how to use it. Um, and if I can't get to the faculty, um, I, I get to the grad students. Um, and I call them the future faculty. And if I can't get the faculty on my campus to adopt something, I will at least get to the graduate students because they're, you know, they, they may be a little bit more flexible and they might be um, very deadline oriented. And if I can tell them that I can save them a day getting their data on board, they're all over it. So um, I, I just take every opportunity, uh, and as idiosyncratic as that is, um, I seem to be getting traction with, with the faculty and, and even with the grad students. And I would say, especially with um, onboarding new faculty, um, mm -hmm. if there are ways to get in front of new faculty at faculty orientation mm -hmm. in particular yep, fields, that. that that's a good way to, to get the word out as well. Yeah, you find people before they found the workarounds, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in, in our case at uh, UCSC, uh, our director of is actually a adjunct faculty of the uh, computer engineering department. And uh, I have been working very closely uh, with the uh, HPC group at the UCSC. I also, I also teach some courses for the uh, applied math and statistics department. So we got to interact with the faculty and res researcher a lot. So the, uh, maybe our situation is a little bit unique, so, but our, our uh, barrier of entry is slightly lower than, than typical situation. There's one more here. <laughs> well, that's how we built this machine learning thing, is I went around and listened to the people who are doing machine learning and found out what they wanted, because nobody was listening to them. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I, can't, 
I, I'm not going to build something, you know, infrastructure-wise for which there's no demand. Um, I'm I'm not in the school. I'm not in the school of thought. Build it, and they will come. Um, I really need to see a demand signal, which is, you know, listening to what people need before. Um, and it doesn't take many. You know, a few thought leaders on campus is enough to sort of trigger me into action. Um, and I'm, when I talk about evangelizing to the faculty, I'm really talking about um, the general faculty population and not those, you know, half a dozen or so that are already on board writing proposals with me, you know, um, doing already out there on, in, in, in the, on the front. When, can I ask a question to this? So um, when you're doing this for SC, is this then peer reviewed? Yeah. Okay. Because as, as, a, as a sitting on the faculty side of things, if it's not peer reviewed, then it's trash. No, I know. And there's high impact. And, uh, okay. There's an about, uh, 50, 60%. Okay. Richard? <laughs> so how is the moderator doing? Um, uh, so so we did um, put uh, systems out in in um, the f five of the six campuses that we uh, that wanted them. Um, that means Santa Cruz has one, uh, Riverside has one. Um, let me see if I can get this together. Santa Cruz, Riverside, Davis, Irvine and San Diego and the one that wasn't shipped yet is Santa Barbara um, the uh, one all but the one in Davis are 10 gig connected um, we have uh, uh, documented that the we've benchmarked the infrastructure at um, and written a paper about it that was submitted yesterday um, and that benchmarking was done between Santa Cruz and, uh, and San Diego, I believe, if I remember correctly. And the people who make the most science use right now out of it is probably the people in Irvine. And the uh, a biggest challenge was um, that we had thought this was a cookie cutter and there was every single one of the cutters looks different. And so there was not much cookie cutting. Um, and because we had committed ourselves from the beginning to say, we don't just want to bring a piece of hardware to you with services. We want to integrate those services in whatever you happen to have available in your group at your campus. And um, when we started out, we didn't have enough imagination to imagine all the different ways that you can swing this. Um, and uh, so that, that uh, it was for that reason, a whole lot more difficult than expected. Um, the second thing that is an equally hard hurdle we found is adoption. So um, you would think that the LSC community is all over this stuff uh, immediately. And it turns out that there is a, a, a step between um, getting it there, verifying that it works, and then teaching the locals how it works. And that step requires additional effort that we hadn't uh, uh, planned in at the same extent. And so the, therefore it works well in adoption where people are very proactive 
And the people who were very proactive from the beginning was Irvine. And so they're the ones who make the most use out of it. And so I think there is a, a, a lot of learning involved, and the, but it is not done uh, nearly at the level where I would have wanted it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, your questions. Um, so I had, had I, I, I'm going to skip my question. I'm going to ask different questions because as after listening to everybody else, um, I am more curious about uh, something else. In fact, I want to ask, um, uh, uh, let me see, Sean and Jeff, um, to what extent does multi-campus collaborations play a role for you or to what extent do multinodal things on campus, collaborations between different corners of campus or across different campuses play a role for you. And does, is that any harder than an, uh, single points? And uh, is there something PRP could do to help? Oh, in, in Sanctuary's case, as following up on the uh, LHC case, actually uh, the PRP has, has already greatly helped our research effort a lot because, uh, as you re uh, as you probably know, that we uh, we used to have a a very anemic uh, gig e switch connecting to our local Atlas Computing cluster, which is actually a bottleneck. Uh, uh, as many network people will know, the the buffer size of that switch is is tiny. It'll kick back. It kick back a lot. So it's actually uh, although we have reasonably uh, good uh, computing power, but, uh, but actually the, the bottleneck really is this uh, gigabit switch. So essentially we cannot even reach, we, uh, basically the LHC is a uh, high throughput computing, right? But we are actually bottlenecked by the, by the, uh, by the gigabit switch. We cannot even do the line rate of giga, uh, gigabit switch. We're mostly, we used to run maybe at most like 100 meg, but the PRP actually greatly help us with your, with your uh, was your new uh, distributed X root D uh, service, right? We also have a, we also have a generous donation of a Piano box from the PRP, which greatly imp increased the bandwidth and computing power of the whole project. And I'm actually I'm actually instructed here. One of my tasks here is actually to to work with Frank's group to further tune our our Alice computing cluster. So this this is a clear example that uh, multi-campus collaboration help our local research. So for me, um, I, I would say that multi-campus um, collaboration is one of those force multipliers. That that uh, that is an area that we constantly seek out. Um, and I'll give an example. The wave uh, was just supposed to be a visualization infrastructure. Um, and in the original plans, it wasn't even connected to the network, really. Um, but I took some of the budget, and I put in a patch panel, and we got dark fiber pulled. Um, and I got a layer one direct to our, um, our edge router. And so that would enable um, something like uh, participation in the Chase CI deep learning project that I wouldn't wouldn't be able to do anymore. And, and that um, force multiplier will survive beyond that project. Um, and that's now infrastructure um, that we can use for many different things. Um, campus to campus inside of the PRP is actually quite easy. Um, outside of the PRP, um, it's it really is still the dark ages. Um, I won't name names, but we, we have a researcher on campus who um, has a fa or has a PhD student, and on her um, her PhD advisors is a faculty at another university, and it's an R1 university, and she wanted to be able to share her genomics data with this other campus, and not only did they not they're not able to receive the data. They don't even know who to talk to to, to build a connection. So, um, and, and we did a download of some data, and it wasn't big data. It was 400 gigabytes from a university in New York City. 
And of course, I first look to see if they're on the research and education networks, and they are. Um, and I do a trace route, and that looks good. It goes, you know, um, on the regional uh, REN to Internet 2 to Scenic to us, and it's a nice, clean path. Uh, and then I start the data transfer, and it's two, three megabytes per second, you know. Um, I can get better data throughput to Cases Lab in Amsterdam or to, you know, Arnet in Australia. Um, they just don't have the concept of a science DMZ, and, and they're not able to support it. So campus-to-campus -campus collaborations um, are greatly enhanced by something like the PRP, where people have worked consistently now for almost two years on removing those data roadblocks um, on the wide area network. Yeah, I think putting pop, uh, you know, DTNs in pops is a great idea. Yeah. So we've started to experiment with that. We have one um, at the LA Exchange. Yeah. Uh, San Jose is also working on that. Right. And yeah. another one's uh, yeah, one Starlight. Yeah. So. Yes, Netlight, but also Starlight. There was another question up here. I had it. I had one more question for Scott. Um, so, when you, it, it, in your, is your problem more where you put the data, or getting it in first place? Meaning, if you had, the, the university UCSD is currently discussing building a data infrastructure, and this may never happen because lots of people, things get discussed that never happen. But uh, if that existed, if there was a data infrastructure at UCSD that you could freely use, would that make a difference? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm a person who always, you know, likes to get all the data, you know, instead of having to subset or. Um, you know, be selective about it. If you know, I have the availability to pull all the data I'd want. I'd want to be able to do that, and then I'd want to be able to store it somewhere. Um, but what we found is is that these numerical weather models, climate models, our data sets are getting so large that um, that we don't know if that's possible. And so we're having to be a little bit more selective on the types of experiments we want to run, um, the size of the data sets we want to actually pull in and and, and utilize. And so, um, and so it's making us rethink how we want to do ex experiments, mm -hmm. uh, given the size uh, and the volume of, of these data sets that are going to be generated over the next you know, three or four years. Um, but if that infrastructure existed and I could pull you know, all 1,000 you know, terabytes, I would. And then figure out a way to go through and subset what I need to do my specific experiment. Um, but um, you know, in, in the case of the example I, I showed, um, you know, the connect algorithm, it kind of allows you to reduce the dimensionality of the data, get, gets it down to something very um, small. And so storage isn't as important uh, for that approach, but, uh, but being able to pull it and, and do the quick mm -hmm. analysis uh, is. So, so the, the final product that you had at the end of your pipeline is what you would want to store? For my research, yes. Yes. Okay.
never make it highly available to anybody with a kiosk. And it's not just on the app. This is on our 40-day rental structure. It's got web services for open tabs. <coughs> that CDF <coughs> web, web, web map tables, web coverage tables, and three different visualization tools, which means you don't even have to pull it across to look at it, to animate it, before you decide, yeah, that's what I'm doing. So if NASA would put a thread server on top of their archives, it would be easy for the child to discover it, number one, to get it in multiple <coughs> formats, number two, and they really need flash display. Mm -hmm. So the, you're advocating a, an upgrade of the source? Or just local mirroring on PRP or something faster than what the mm -hmm. low archive is living on current. Okay. Javi? Say that again? Not to take a message out of it. So part of engagement is defining standards. Right? If you have to an anonymize it, that's okay. But you know, for every research group on every campus, show them the performance they get compared to others. And then they can imagine how much effort they're wasting and how much the efficiency of their work and their effectiveness is degraded by not using the standards. Okay. Okay. So we we've sort of overshot by four minutes, and I think I'm in the we're in uh, there is coffee next. So what's next? No, there's another session. There's another there. session. So I'm actually taking away time from somebody else. Yes. Okay. So that I better stop. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>